this little bad boy up front last week at the back of Breakpoint Live. Um, nice demonstration. Yeah, now we're missing the water. <laughs> but I guess the, the effect is going to be still the same. Yeah, it's now sitting on a dry dock. <laughs> All right, so the last speaker of the evening from Reactor is going to be Atte Koyo about uh, the autonomous ferry. So please give it up for Atte. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Welcome from my part. Uh, as you can see, my name is Atte Koyo. I come here from Reactor. I'm a programmer. Uh, I'm gonna. We have now two guys from Rolls Royce thinking, talking about large ships and <laughs> driving uh, large autonomous vessels, carry freighters, whatever. Uh, I'm gonna start from the really small. So, how can you actually build a really small scale model of an autonomous ferry and make it do uh, something sensible that at least looks like real? So, how, how do you do? How do you make a ferry that actually? Uh, carries a small autonomous vehicle from one harbor, if you want to say so, to another. So that this looks realistic and you can actually spend nine hours just uh, looking at the little thing going back and forth. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show you a, a short demo video uh, about the ferry in action that we actually shot uh, a week ago at Reactor Breakpoint. Hold. Make sure my sound is on and all right. I guess we have the. That was what it was doing for nine hours. Uh, the only pause was that we changed the batteries once in a while. But <laughs> okay, uh, uh, let's start from the basic stuff. That how do we actually build this thing? So what, what has what actually does it have inside? Inside uh, the ship body, it has been manufactured outside. We don't know how to do 3D modeling or manufacturing anything. It's uh, of vacuum formed plastic. So basically, you just you make a uh, cavity model, uh, then you uh, spread plastic on top, and then you have a vacuum underneath which sucks the plastic into form. So it's one piece. If anybody has seen uh, our autonomous ship at Slush a while ago, it was made from two-piece printed plastic and MDF. And as you could guess, the seam didn't keep water, and the whole thing got soaked. <laughs> <laughs> it had really trouble keeping afloat at the end. Uh, the support beams here, uh, these are 3D printed. Then it has some pieces of plexiglass uh, for uh, supporting the components inside and to act as the deck of the ferry. Uh, really, really simple design. Uh, the only difficult part was just getting the hull ordered and <laughs> shipped to us. The propulsion system is off-the-shelf RC stuff. So it just, we just ordered uh, the motors, the servos, uh, the everything from uh, Gruppner. The, this one originally was uh, be, uh, capable of being driven by a remote controller, but once we were sufficiently certain that it actually doesn't do anything drastic, we removed the remote control parts, and now it's just driving itself. <laughs> And on top of the standard RC stuff, there's a Raspberry Pi sitting inside and a pulse width modulation shield that is actually driving the motors. Uh, uh, then the magic that makes it actually know where it is, we have uh, ultrasound 
positioning system from Marble, Marble Mind. So basically, we have two beacons here, and then we install receivers uh, around the, for example, around the pool that we had, and then the ship can actually locate itself. Uh, one of, uh, thing to note, if you're ever going to try to use ultrasound positioning, the fluorescent lights produce ultrasound. <laughs> they don't mix with those th things. We were uh, developing this in the dark for one and a half weeks because <laughs> we only had fluorescent lights in the basement where we had the pool. <laughs> yeah, okay, so the, probably the more interesting thing is the uh, software that's actually uh, driving this thing. So how does it actually move? I think I accidentally once used the phrase that ferry won't drive itself <laughs> when going back to programming. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, all the software that's uh, moving this thing is running on the Raspberry Pi here. Uh, in Slush, we had this thing that used uh, image recognition. It had, it had neural network and everything that, uh, so that the ship could see actually where it's going. But that uh, required a huge GPU, which, for which we don't have space. It doesn't actually carry that much weight, and we don't have enough power on the ship. So we decided to go kind of like the traditional route. This one is driven by a positioning system, which is a bit similar than a GPS. We get the location, and when we have two beacons, we can get the orientation of the ship. So now everything is running on the Raspberry Pi. It really does know how to drive itself. It doesn't need any external assistance. Uh, it's software-wise, we made a somewhat uh, clever decision. Uh, Inadvertently, in the beginning, we had the motor control is from the old system. It's been written in a different language than the rest of the system. Uh, so we want to keep it separate. Uh, so uh, all the components are actually talking to each other via a message bus. So it's a fully event-driven system. The, uh, the components don't actually know about each other. The motor control, it only receives commands to uh, throttle or turn the thrusters to a certain angle and apply a certain amount of throttle. And then it translates those to the commands for the actual motor control hardware. So we, uh, first thing we did, we abstracted away the motor control to a few simple commands so that we can keep it separate from the rest of the system. Uh, the next thing we developed on top of the motor control is a thing we called autopilot, which is very uh, traditional autopilot both autopilot, so you give it a uh, point that, okay, I want to navigate there, and then it just steers the boat towards the uh, given waypoint and stops when it gets there. And that it uh, achieves by measuring its current position uh, given by the beacons and then applying commands to the motor control until it reaches the given location. Uh, in the end, we ended up developing several pilots because we found out that uh, driving that like it had a rudder is not a very good way to approach the quays. It doesn't know how to turn it itself into a correct orientation if, if it drifts for somehow and it's very difficult to uh, steer the boat when it's kind of like steering only one end. So we developed another one that actually knows how to rotate the ship on in, uh, in place and knows how to drive backwards side, sideways, whichever, so that it can actually align itself properly when it's approaching the quay. And then we have a, the, a one pilot that only knows how to drive forward at full thrust. <laughs> uh, that's because when you dock the boat, we don't have any mechanical locking on the, on the quays. So the only way to keep the boat in place is to drive full thrust towards the quay so that it stays put. Stays put. <laughs> So uh, that's actually, if you have been on the small passenger ferries that carry tourists, that, that they actually do that very often, so they don't actually attach the boat. They just throw the ropes for safety, but they just drive towards the quay so that the uh, boat keeps where it sh should be. And of course, we had to implement a fourth one that uh, does nothing that stops the motors. It's, it's really important. As the, <laughs> as, as the previous presentation is already, so it's, it's really important. You can actually stop it when you when you need on, uh, on command. Uh, the, on top of the autopilot layer, then we have something called routing, 
which actually makes sure that the ball, uh, ferry ends up where it actually should be. So given an end destination, then it draws it a route which it has to follow, and then tells the autopilot that, okay, which mode you should be driving where. So when you're driving long distances, it's beneficial to keep always the thrusters pointing forward and then just slightly turn them so that the boat slowly turns. That's more economical. And when you uh, start arriving, your end destination sort of way, then you switch modes and start driving kind of like uh, with more finesse so that you actually end up where you should be. Uh, of course, when we had just a single pool with no other obstacles than the sides and the quays, uh, we managed to do that with only two endpoints. So one, you reach the quay from the correct angle, stop there, and then the approach pilot will uh, slowly inch the boat to the port. Or given that our positioning was pretty inaccurate, it usually just bumped into the bay and settled, uh, settled, settled into the correct position. So it was like uh, the, you know, the Nauvoo ferries, if you ever traveled those. So that's uh, full thrust. And then the uh, old uh, car tires in the quays, they take care of stopping the boat. And <laughs> what not. Uh, and then what's uh, driving this, and then we have a separate positioning component that does nothing but broadcasts the current position of the ship. So it reads the mm -hmm. uh, beacons and then broadcasts the position so that the, both the router and the autopilot know where the ship is going and it can make decisions to uh, where to go. Uh, then on top of that we had the whole simulation that actually controlled the whole uh, system in the pool that we had. So both the, both the car, the quays and the ramps that were on the quays so that it actually drove one to the one end and then off the boat and back, back to the boat again. Uh, Technology-wise, we're uh, using a pretty standard stack. The, all the software that we wrote for this one is uh, written in Python. We had a small discussion when we started the project. We almost chose Rust, but since nobody in the team actually knew how to program in Rust, <laughs> we decided it might be safer to uh, concentrate on the actual problem of getting the boat moving and use, just use Python. Uh, uh, the nice side effect is that whatever you wish to do, you always have a library for, in Python for doing that. So you don't have to go hunt around in the internet, uh, in the shady website, or coding your own drivers for the thing. So everything just, uh, kind of like logistically, everything just works. Once we got figured out, okay, how, how do we make system with several modules, several independent processes, so that we don't get all the dependencies in the huge knot. <laughs> Uh, the message bus is MQTT. It uh, well, suits very well to the Raspberry Pi. It's very lightweight, but it provides the, all the necessary published subscribed uh, systems that we actually need there. And one of the guys, he was actually fami already familiar with MQTT from his uh, previous hobby project. So that was really no problem. That was actually one of the smarter decisions, that, smartest decisions that we actually made during the whole project. The original design was that, okay, we have this process, and then it has a list of receivers that to whom it's actually going to send the packets. That worked when we had two processes, which we could just use UDP locally and just send packets and configure that, okay, use and here and use and there. And then when we had, uh, sorry, had, when, when we had three, then we had all the problem with the configuration files. That, okay, somebody's always sending to some, uh, the wrong guy. And then, we, okay, okay, we're all middle-aged middle programmers. We know we are ESB. And you know, a message program that was, and then uh, everything was smooth, smooth sailing from that point onwards, uh, architecture wise. Uh, Node.js is just a, uh, that's old legacy, so the motor controller has been written in Node.js. It was working, it did what it had to do, so we had so no reason to start replacing that one. So it's just there happily issuing PWM commands to the uh, motor system. Okay, uh, then the actual part, okay, okay, you have a, a ferry that actually knows how to drive from one place to another, it has a positioning system and yeah, it has to keep correct uh, orientation, everything. How do, what kind of uh, artificial intelligence you actually need for something like this? Actually, 
I have three, for, three words for that. That's proportional, integral, and derivative control. So, okay, how many knows what the PID controller is? The rest of you should also. If you're ever, ever going to control anything, uh, any real hardware that does something real, you really have to know one thing about uh, industrial control, and that's PID controllers. That's the most fundamental thing you can have. It has three parameters. It's about two lines of code, and it's, it's just magic. It keeps, a, it keeps a ship on its course. It's actually been designed to do that. The, control for, uh, the theory for PID controllers was actually developed in the 1930s to four ship autopilots. <laughs> yeah, so large cruise ships uh, were the first customers of the formalized PID controllers in the 1930s. We kind of closed the loop, and there they are again, <laughs> getting a boat from one place to another. Uh, then, of course, given this level of AI, it's not very impressive uh, as an autonomous ship. ship. So what we're actually doing now, as we speak, well, I'm not doing it actually as we speak, but uh, tomorrow when I get back, uh, we're going to start integrating. We have uh, two LIDARs, actual industrial grade stuff that we got on loan from a supplier, and then we have an IMU board. So we're going to integrate more sensors to, to the ship so that we can actually, it can actually start uh, perceiving its surroundings. The first application is to mark the quays so that we have a reflective markers or something on there so that the leaders can see clearly so that we can detect them very reliably. And based on that, we can then locate the ship when it's near the quay, that, okay, it knows exactly where it is. The, these things, they are, in, in this scale, they are not very precise. They are something like four or five centimeters uh, precision, but they're really accurate. So they keep that. So they just, they have random error, but they're always very accurate. Whereas the beaconing system, of course, when it's triangulated, it's, it might jump a couple of meters back and forth. So it's, when you're trying to do close maneuvers, it's a real uh, pain to have the ship suddenly decided, okay, I need to go left, and then it runs into something. So we're getting to uh, integrating more sensors to the system so that we can get more smooth control. And then we can actually start playing with Kalman filters, which is not, uh, which is our things that start getting really interesting, and then we start really start uh, tracking the position of the ship with some real accuracy. Uh, with that, we can then start thinking th uh, things about collision avoidance and navigation, which are uh, kind of interrelated subjects. So basically, we know there are fixed obstacles on the course, so shallow waters, rocks, actual land, whatever. So you have to navigate around those, and then you have the, all the uh, harbor structures that you have to navigate around, and then there are moving things like boats. Uh, those ba basically, those are handled by the same. Uh, layer of software that makes sure that the ship ends where it should be uh, without actually colliding into anything and dri driving at the uh, proper speed whenever. Uh, the uh, previous version, it actually had cameras, so it had image detection. It could detect passing boats, for example. We had a radio control boat that you could drive before the uh, ship, and then it knew, how to, knew, knew to stop when the boat was too close. That, okay, I'm not able to maneuver around the boat. I'll just, I'll just stop and wait until the obstacle goes away, and then I move forward. But for that level, we'd need a bigger boat if you want to uh, have it drive itself, and because it really can't carry a full PC chassis on top of the heart now. So we're trying to make do what we have with the kind of like the basic sensor, so the positioning, so the, la the laser sensor. Uh, yeah. That, that can provide pretty good uh, object detection, so you can see that what's, what's around the ship, and then you can start making decisions to what actually to do when something hits the radar. And well, one, one thing, if you, know, the, you who were in, at breakpoint, you should, saw that the docking procedure was not exactly uh, silk smooth, and that's one reason for that was that the positioning was a bit inaccurate, and we didn't have that much time to really tune the autopilot so that 
it would really it, it would approach the uh, quite smoothly. So given given a uh, good enough positioning data that actually knows drives itself a lot better than I could. <laughs> but uh, that, that needs the uh, couple of next step next steps. Uh, as I sh uh, showed you on the video, we did a demonstration of this at reactor breakpoint a week ago. Uh, it successfully operated for nine hours. Uh, only once the car tried to make suicide by driving off the boat. Fortunately, I was near enough, so I, <laughs> I saved it from. We, have, we, we actually have two of those, so losing one would not have been the end of the world, but we prefer to keep the hardware in working condition. <laughs> so uh, the simulation, what, what it actually did, it started from the uh, from standstill, the car on board, it drove to one port, docked quay, then ramped, ramped came down the car, drove onto the shore, on, on shore, so on, on the quay, made a full turn, then drove back on boat, ramp uh, went up, and the ferry sailed to the other quay. And it just kept doing this until we lifted it off the water. So this was a demonstration of, okay, uh, with quite a small, amount of work, you can actually build this stuff. This is a really, really rudimentary implementation of an autonomous uh, sea vessel, but still it works. It carries its a cargo from one place to another. And even given, with the, given the uh, quite crude mechanical tolerances that we have, we really did build all of this in kind of a hurry. Uh, it's still uh, never on, when the, the ship was on dock, we dropped the car into the water, uh, which I myself consider quite an achievement for the team that we had, of which I'd like to talk a bit about uh, next. So this uh, thing, the whole the system was developed basically by three people in about three weeks' time. And given that we were sitting it at our headquarters, we've been, we ha were, continuously harassed by our sales uh, into doing, well, well what, you, what, what do you get to do when you are sitting uh, uh, as a sitting duck in the headquarters being a senior developer? Uh, we had a, a featuring autonomous car expert, so basically the guy who uh, loaded the Arduino uh, model that drove the car from uh, one place to other following a black line. I think that took two days of coding and then some fixes so that it was uh, somewhat reliable and could uh, receive radio commands from the ferry. And a robot expert who actually built this thing. So we had an external consultant who ordered all the parts and printed the, uh, these arcs and everything so that he put all this everything together. We are not really mechanical experts. And as it turned out during the project, my hands and scale, small scale, scale models actually really don't mix. So we had one guy who had nimble enough fingers so that he would operate the <laughs> electronics inside, and I was just uh, delegated to lifting the deck and <laughs> moving the ship around in the pool. Uh, the great thing about the team is that even though we are all were software developers, we have, uh, uh, there was, uh, there was, it was kind of a cross-functional team. We were all pretty old hats at software development. Uh, I, I actually hadn't uh, done any uh, production work with Python before. I had to pick it up on the way. The guys uh, really didn't want to use Go or C++. So, uh, so but I had, two, I had two guys to learn from, so that went uh, pretty smoothly. Uh, one of us has a background in industrial control. I'm, I have a digital signal processing background, and one is just an old Java bull, like we say. <laughs> so he's been writing back-end software uh, from the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, and then there was, uh, we had some hobbyist exp expertise. Uh, two of the guys, not me, are sailors. They actually, one of them actually owns also sailing yacht, and he's doing all kinds of uh, Arduino Raspberry Pi projects to enhance his <laughs> Both, uh, and well, he, he, well, he's an electronics hobbyist. I, in a distant, distant 
past I also was involved with actual electronics, uh, writing software for, for medical devices. So we had some, uh, some, some so actually we, we know that, okay, which way electricity flows and how digital uh, stuff works, but so that we had some concept of how, how the actual hardware works, how the ship works, and then we had a long, long, long experience software development in different fields. So combining this expertise and the small bit of hobbyist background, we were actually able to implement something working in three weeks' time, uh, starting where, where two of us, us had never seen, seen a Asipod equipped ship <laughs> uh, before, but just from long, long distance. So, uh, uh, that's pretty much uh, it. The short story about how, uh, uh, how three guys and a piece of plastic uh, came into a working autonomous ferry in a, a bit under a month and even operated pretty much as it should have. Which uh, I have to say that it was pretty exciting to turn up uh, in the Mesokeskus in Helsinki at uh, 7.30 in the morning, fire up the ferry, put the car pretty much for the first time on the deck so that it will drive more than just one a leg of the journey. <laughs> and then say, uh, issuing the start com command from the uh, crude uh, visualizers UI that we wrote and see that, okay, it actually does work and it <laughs> drives itself. Uh, and, and, uh, Nothing went. We once broke the uh, mains power cable accidentally, but that was just mechanical failure due to the ham handedness of the guy uh, switching the battery to a new one. But other than that, we had no problems. It was awesome to watch for nine hours. <laughs> okay, uh, that's pretty much uh, my story. Uh, any questions about the ferry, the project, software, anything? Yeah. Uh, Easy question to start with. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I would divide, define uh, it as something that the uh, machine uh, does, operates, uh, or uh, performs its task so that the human operator only has to supervise and doesn't have to uh, get involved into the getting the task, task complete. More questions? Yeah? Oh, this one's a heavy hitter. <laughs> yeah, <hard> one. <laughs> no, uh, you mentioned that the uh, kind of challenge in having the computer vision and, and the neural network, that was the weight, basically, the, the, the hardware that you need to have. So I think it would be cool uh, to have, because uh, you're working on a small scale, you have a wireless connection to like, an edge computer, you can use a whatever, a supercomputer to make the computations. Of course, a little bit of latency, but I guess that with this scale, that would be an interesting thing to test. Yeah, that's actually what we did in Slush, and based on the experience from there, we decided that we don't want any off-board computing, because uh, unlike in a kind of like normal uh, environment, these conferences, they are full of Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah. Nice. So, there are the... Uh, Wi-Fi connection from the ferry transmitting the uh, uh, video feed to the computer doing the actual computation. It was so shaky and the uh, bandwidth uh, fluctuated so much that there were uh, oftentimes big, very large delays between uh, getting the image feed uh, and the control commands back to the ferry. So that it was just a safety measure yeah. And at that point. So basically, if you have a more controlled environment, then that's a lot easier to do. Yeah. Yeah, connectivity is always a problem. Yeah. It's a problem for us, but it's interesting that it's also in a very small scale it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the one, one of the key things that the previous team learned in Slush is that the Raspberry Pi, either the Wi-Fi chip itself or the driver, it has 127 slots for Wi-Fi networks. And if your Wi-Fi drops at place 128 or 29, the poor thing doesn't even see it. So then you're uh, resorted to boot, uh, shutting it off and on again, <laughs> hoping that it will actually see your Wi-Fi first before the 300 other ones that are visible on your booth. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Uh, one thing is, is that the, the uh, Beacon software actually does this, uh, combining the information, so it does the fusion, so it calculates the position of these both and then can tell that, okay, which position is in the middle and what's the orientation. But the reason actually is more practical is that the, uh, these things, they have an IMU, so they have a compass, but it's a very low quality compass, so it keeps spinning around. <laughs> so if you if you only put one beacon here, we actually don't know which way, which way around the ship is. So it's very very uh, uh, kind of sens sensitive noise. We did a bit of debugging yet, uh, yesterday and today with an oscilloscope that actually is it a uh, power input input so the. Uh, switch mode power supply in the Raspberry Pi, or what, what, what it probably, which we uh, hypothesize. We guess it's probably just magnetic fields, especially generated by the motors, uh, the DC motors on the uh, ship, but the compass that wasn't stable enough to use it for the ship because that's the only, we have, we have only one positioning device now. Uh, so, yeah, th yeah this, was, this was actually a problem because the uh, positioning is a, a, a lot more unreliable with two beacons than just one, because these keep interfering each with each other, of course. <laughs> nice. And one more? You had a question? Uh, yeah, I would like to know if you have tried out the, the autonomous ship in, uh, in storm weather or only black app. <laughs> yeah, actually, that, that was one of the most uh, common questions in the conference was that, can we get waves here? <laughs> So of course it's it, it's it's really interesting to see that okay how the control system keeps the uh, ship on course when there's uh, currents or wind or anything because well that's that that's well, well you have a kind of a river there flowing through the city and if you want to cross it with an autonomous ferry you have to take into account that the, actually the water flows while you're driving on it <laughs> so yeah that's that's yeah but unfortunately we don't have any current or wave generator in our pool so. Just get it in kick. Yeah. Yeah. Well. That, yeah. Well. We did. Yeah, we did that. Well, of course, this, the navigation system here always drives the back back to the same point where it wants to be, and then continues from there. So even if you push the ferry around the pool, then it gets eventually it returns back to where it should be, and then navigates from there to the, to the dock, so that uh, it doesn't drive so try to drive uh, drive through the walls or anything. <laughs> yeah. We were smart enough to implement that because we knew that you take it to a conference, so people will, will want to push it and turn it the wrong way around and see that, okay, there's no uh, cheating uh, in the boat that, okay, now it just drives 10 seconds straight and then it turns and then five seconds straight. <laughs> yeah. Also, quite many people actually peeked underwater to see that there are no wires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in Turku we have this thing called Furry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we, so we, let's uh, let's give a big round of applause to Mark.